Railways and snow are two things that rarely go together in Australia. In a country with no permanent snow, and very few railways at high altitudes, actually seeing a train running through cold white stuff is a pretty rare experience. The Blue Mountains line in New South Wales can occasionally be subjected to snowstorms, as can the higher parts of the Tasmanian network, and very rarely some lines in my home state of Victoria can get a light covering. But there's only one true alpine railway in the country, and that is Ski Tube, a unique electrified rack railway isolated in the mountains of southern New South Wales. Now, if there's one thing Australia isn't known for, it's mountains. However, the Great Dividing Range does get a decent covering of snow during winter in southern New South Wales and Victoria, supporting a substantial ski industry. Tucked into the snowy mountains a couple of hours south of Canberra is the winter resort town of Jindabyne. Not far from that is the Perisher Valley Ski Fields, a stone's throw from Australia's highest mountain, Mount Kosciuszko, which stands at a modest, by world standards, 2,228 metres above sea level. In the late 1970s, Perisher was starting to become a pretty busy place, and the Kosciuszko Road was getting congested and dangerous. It's probably worth mentioning that very few Australians are experienced winter drivers, with many of us never even seeing snow until well into adulthood, let alone driving a car in it. In addition to the pressures of traffic bound for Perisher, a new ski resort was about to open on Mount Blue Cow, just a few kilometres up from Perisher. So a proper transport solution was urgently needed. Inspiration was sought from the country that has perfected alpine transport, and transport in general, Switzerland. Various options were considered, including a cable car, a funicular, and a surface level narrow gauge railway. But ultimately, a mostly underground standard gauge rack railway was chosen as the best option, with the lower terminal located just below the snow line. A major benefit of the underground route was to minimise environmental damage caused by the new alignment, an essential consideration as the route falls entirely within the beautiful and ecologically significant Kosciuszko National Park. Going underground also has obvious benefits when it comes to operating in extreme alpine weather. The railway opened in two stages in 1987 and 88, becoming Australia's first entirely rack-equipped railway, although two other railways had historically existed in the country using a rack for part of their length, those being the Mount Morgan Line in Queensland and the Mount Lyle Line in Tasmania, the latter of which has since been restored to operation as the West Coast Wilderness Railway, so you can still ride it today. There were also a couple of small industrial rack railways in New South Wales. You can read about all Australia's rack railways in great detail in this book. The line was electrified at 1500 volts DC, making it the same voltage and gauge as the Sydney Suburban Network, although that's where the similarities end. The line begins at Bullock's Flat, about 20 kilometres along the Alpine Way from Jindabyne and 1,132 metres above sea level. Shortly after departure, trains cross the Threadbow River on a low bridge before getting stuck into the steep 1 in 8 gradient, that's 12.5%, which is maintained all the way up to Perisher Valley. The line crosses a substantial curved viaduct, then continues to climb to a short crossing loop known as Loop A. Having now travelled 2.2 kilometres from Bullock's Flat, this is the last place you'll see sunlight anywhere on the line, as trains now plunge into the 3.3 kilometre long Bilston Tunnel, which climbs in a mostly straight line up to Berisher Valley. The tunnel was named after Ken Bilston, the engineer who came up with the initial proposal for the line, although it sounds like he borrowed a lot of ideas from another proposal by John Dunn at Comenge. Somewhere in this tunnel is the deepest point below ground of any railway in Australia, where the line reaches about 550 metres below the surface passing under the Ramshead Range. Midway up the tunnel, space was allowed for a second crossing loop to be built, presumably Loop B, however this never eventuated. Perisher Valley Station, 1,716 metres above sea level, is an island platform with an additional platform on one side. Trains from Bullock's Flat terminate here, with the line beyond to Blue Cow operated as a shuttle, so the centre platform allows for passengers to change directly between the two trains. On departure from Perisher, there is a very noticeable change in tunnel style. While the Bilston Tunnel is a smooth tube dug by a tunnel boring machine, the 2.6km Blue Cow Tunnel up to the summit was dug using the drill and blast technique, apparently due to some less stable geology in this area. This results in a very interesting rough cut shape to the tunnel profile. Leaving Perisher, the line drops downgrade briefly to dive under the Perisher Creek, then climbs at a relatively sedate 1 in 33 grade before a final pitch of 1 in 8 to the summit. The terminus at Blue Cow is a simple dead end with a single platform. The far end of the platform is used for unloading supplies and loading rubbish into the line's solitary operating goods wagon, which was built on the frames of a former State Rail Authority bogey guards van. Blue Cow has no road access at all in winter, so just like a good Swiss Alpine railway, 
A goods wagon is propelled up the mountain by one of the passenger trains on a regular basis, which is also arguably the only remaining example of a regular mixed train operating anywhere in the country. Early plans actually suggested closing the road to Perisher Valley in winter too, and in that scenario the railway was going to be double track, but sadly that never happened. Blue Cow Station is 1,893 metres above sea level, making it by far the highest point on any railway in Australia. And there are some pretty spectacular views of the Alps to be had just a short walk from the station. Both Blue Cow and Perisher Valley stations were built using the cut and cover technique, with the building over the top making them effectively underground stations. A practical choice for protection from extreme weather and heavy snowfalls. You may have noticed that I've already mentioned several national records held by this railway. So far we have Australia's only electrified rack railway, only railway with a rack over its entire length, deepest railway tunnel, highest altitude railway, oh and it's also the longest railway tunnel in Australia. Even if you count the tunnels either side of Perisher separately, the two tunnels are both individually longer than the next longest example. Although this record is soon to be roughly equaled by a new tunnel through Queensland's Toowoomba Range being built as part of the Inland Rail Project. SkiTube is operated by a small fleet of electric multiple units, designed by everyone's favourite Australian rolling stock manufacturer, Comange, and the bodies were built at their factory in Granville in suburban Sydney. Many components relating to the rack operation, including the motor bogies, were provided by Swiss company SLM, whose name you'll see all over the European rack railway scene. Eleven carriages were built, with a mixture of motor cars, trailer cars and driving trailers, making up four trains. The cars don't have any obvious numbering system, and the sets simply carry the numbers 1 to 4. Set number 1 is a three car set made up of a motor car, a trailer, and a driving trailer. Set 2 is a four car set with two intermediate trailer cars. Sets 3 and 4 are both short two car sets consisting of just a motor and a driving trailer. As with most rack railways, the trains are all oriented with the motor car at the downhill end of the train. The trains are limited to 40 km per hour, with four car sets limited to 34 km per hour when climbing the one in eight grade. I'm not sure why that applies to four car sets only. Running down the one in eight, all trains are limited to a much more cautious 21 km per hour. These very specific speeds are dictated by the Swiss regulations for rack rally operation. During busy periods, trains three and four usually operate coupled as a four car set and the usual arrangement seems to be set one operating the Blue Cow shuttle, while the two four-car sets run the lower half of the line, crossing at the loop just outside the tunnel portal. It's interesting to consider that the train made up of sets three and four would have a substantially higher power-to-weight ratio than set two, with double the motor cars for the same length of train. These trains have a lot of unusual design features. They're just under 3.8 metres wide, making them, I think, the widest passenger cars anywhere in the world. They're built to a high capacity metro style layout with six doors per side, minimal seating and lots of handrails for standees. There is no carpet or upholstery of any kind, which is necessary as the car interiors get very wet from all the snow melt running off people's clothing and equipment. And you can see the same thing at the stations. These things across the middle of the car are crush barriers designed to reduce injuries if the train has to stop suddenly with lots of standing passengers. This isn't a problem on normal adhesion railways, but rack trains are capable of stopping very quickly in an emergency. Oddly, there's no dedicated space for skis and snowboards in the trains, so everyone just has to hang on to them, although many people hire their equipment up the top anyway. Like most trains that spend a lot of time underground, an emergency exit door is fitted to the front of the cab, complete with a narrow end platform and steps down to ground level. There's no space in the tunnels to evacuate out the side doors, so you can see why the end doors are needed. Unusually for an alpine train, they have no significant snow plough, just a tiny little one mounted on the front of the bogey. Obviously the snow never gets particularly deep on the above ground section of the line. The driver sits on the right, which is a strange choice given left hand drive is standard on the main New South Wales rail network. You might think this is part of the Swiss design influence, but no, trains in Switzerland are also usually driven from the left. The motor cars are extremely powerful, rated at 1240 kilowatts, that's 1660 horsepower each, and it's been suggested that this might make them the most powerful electric rack rail cars in the world. The traction motors power the cog wheels only, with the regular wheels on the running rails just freewheeling, so these trains actually can't move without a rack. There is some rack free trackage within the workshops, and a small diesel shunter is used to move the trains in this area. A slightly less positive record held by SkiTube is that it is by far the most expensive 17km round trip rail journey in Australia. 
Everything about downhill skiing is expensive, and this railway is no exception. For most people, the fare of the train is built into their skiing pass or holiday package, but if you're mad like me and you just want to go for a ride on the train, you have to fork out an eye-watering $110. Given they don't really expect people to just go for joy rides, this cost also includes access to the resort and national park fees, but even so, it's remarkably expensive. So for just over three decades now, SkiTube has been doing a pretty great job of fulfilling this very niche transport need, and is a great example of how adaptable rail transport can be. The line only operates during the ski season, usually June to October, and hibernates for the rest of the year. The environmental and safety benefits of this line are huge, dramatically reducing car mileage on the mountain, which amongst other things is great news for the alpine wildlife. It's much harder to get run over by a slowly moving train carrying 800 people than by the several hundred cars those people would otherwise be driving. The above ground footprint of the line is quite minimal and certainly less than the road going up the mountain or in fact the ski runs themselves. The system is very energy efficient. Trains running downhill use regenerative braking, producing power that can then be used by trains running uphill, something that's very well suited to this line given trains are often running in both directions simultaneously. However, there is one big giveaway that this isn't a fully Swiss operation. Just about every rack railway in Europe connects with a mainline railway at the lower terminus, integrating them into the broader transport network. SkiTube, however, is still very much a car-dependent operation, with Bullock's Flat essentially just being a big park and ride. In fact, adding to my previous comment about the line having a pretty small footprint, by far the biggest part of that is the car park. The only public transport connection is a Greyhound bus, which operates once a day between Sydney and Threadbow via Canberra. It arrives at Bullock's Flat at 2 in the afternoon and heads back at 2.45, so not viable for any kind of day trip. It's not even that cheap, so I'd be interested to know who the target market for this service actually is. I personally think it would be cool if the line extended 20 odd k's up the valley to Jindabyne. That way people could stay in the town and not have to drive back and forth each day. This bit would ideally need to be a regular adhesion railway to allow higher speeds, so you'd need trains capable of running both with and without a rack, as is common on many Swiss lines. In fact, an extension to Jindabyne was actually included as an option in some of the early sketches for the route. Anyway, if you're ever in the mountains and feel like riding a train that's as interesting as it is expensive, I do recommend a trip up to Blue Cow, even if it's just to admire the view. Thanks for watching.